Welcome back to Nature's Corner. My name is Erin Shaw. I'm a naturalist with Ohio Department of Natural Resources. On today's show, we're going to be talking about bald eagles. We have a very special guest with us today, Laura Kearns. Thank you so much for being on the show. You're we're welcome. lucky to have you here. So tell us a little bit about your background and, and what you do now. Sure. Well, I'm currently a wildlife biologist for the Division of Wildlife. Um, I focus on non-game bird species. So that means eagles, uh, a variety of wetland bird species, forest birds. It's really quite a uh, diversity that I work, work with and try to work with. Um, and I, I have a, I, I've been in the field for about 20 plus years. Um, I worked with a variety of species, including um, cranes and songbirds, as well as uh, eagles. And uh, I have a master's in resource ecology management and a PhD in wildlife science. Wow. So that's quite a dream job to work with birds and. Yeah. Yeah. So what else do you do? Did you say you were in a helicopter yesterday? Uh, yeah, well, actually, just this past week, we've been flying the midwinter eagle surveys along with the midwinter waterfowl surveys for the state. So we fly all over the state and count waterfowl as well as eagles. And um, so, yeah, we were flying actually through this area just a few days ago in the helicopter wow. looking for oh. eagles. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So you're based out of Columbus, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do you do with the, the research that you get? Yeah, so, um, so with the eagles, one of the things we're trying to do is just keep monitoring them so we can keep track of their population. Um, and this is uh, data that will not only help us at the state level, but goes into national um, surveys of the, the birds. Um, so yeah, everybody across the country has been doing midwinter mid eagle surveys the last uh, week or so. Hmm. Um, so yeah, it's just to help keep track of the population. That's very good. So bald eagles right now is a hot topic at our in our parks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never thought we had eagles. When I was a kid, I you know, we never saw them. Mm -hmm. And um, just recently, there's been, seems like an explosion of, of population. Yes. And I think it's because of the, the research um, that people like you do and the conservation efforts and at one time the bald eagles were on the endangered species list correct so tell us why why that was yeah well one of the big problems with bald eagles and a lot of other birds was um, the pesticide DDT um, that was causing the um, when the eagles laid their eggs their eggshells were too thin and so they weren't able to hatch out any chicks and reproduce so this led to a drastic decline in the eagle population. At one point, there were fewer than 500 um, breeding pairs in the continental United States. Um, so a big step there was um, the banning of DDT, and gradually the eagles started to come back from that. Um, some things that were done here in the state is uh, there were, uh, you know, stepped up efforts to rehabilitate any injured eagles. They would um, cross foster eagle, like if there's extra eggs or chicks in a nest, they would cross foster them into a nest that didn't have as many young. So that helped to, to boost the population and helped it to recover. And so over time, that all helped to bolster the population. So in the late 70s, we only had a few uh, breeding pairs of eagles in the state. Now we have over 300 breeding pairs. I think state. somewhere I read there were only four nests in Ohio right. at one point. Right. I know. So it's been truly an amazing, incredible recovery. Absolutely. So why DDT, that's pesticide, mm -hmm. like bug spray, right? Right. And right. why would that affect the bald eagles? Um, well, I don't know uh, specifically all the chemical interactions, but for whatever reason, the, the pesticide affected that that eggshell property. And in your, um, your top level birds in the ecosystem, they would ingest, like the pesticide would get into the water, into different um, aquatic species. Uh, birds like the eagle would feed on the fish, and there would be something called bioaccumulation, which would um, increase the, the toxicity of the pesticide, and that caused for whatever, again, I don't know the chemical uh, explanation for it, but caused the, um, when the birds laid their eggs, they just 
where it, it broke down the, the eggshells and and um, and they just weren't able to yeah. to survive. So basically, the the poison traveled up the food chain, right, and exactly. became more concentrated. Yes, yes. So it affected a lot of other species too. A lot of our water bird species, um, cranes, uh, all sorts of other raptors, peregrine falcons. Um, hmm. So it was a, it was a major problem. So getting that pesticide banned was a huge um, uh, accomplishment at a policy level. Yeah. And, and after learning about the, the bald eagles and their recovery and, and why the decline happened, so now personally I, I have stopped using, like, um, what do you call it, decon mm -hmm. and poison for rodents mm -hmm. because it could be the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, they go out, they're poisoned, and then mm -hmm. it travels up the food chain. So right. we have to be really careful as citizens, you know, what we're putting into the environment. Absolutely, yes, yes. Uh, you know, taking care with what <laughs> goes into the environment is, is really important. I think a lot of times, um, you know, we forget about what we do in our daily lives and how, what kind of impacts it can have. And so, Absolutely. you know, using organic products and um, whatever you can to limit the use of adding chemicals into the environment is a, is a good step to take if you're interested in conservation of, of birds and other wildlife. And the bald eagle, in my opinion, is that's the best example of conservation and education you know, to see it come Absolutely. back because it's happened in my lifetime. Like I said, when yeah. I was a kid, we never saw eagles or talked about them. I, mm -hmm. I can remember the first time I saw one was at the park at Caesar Creek. Oh. Mm -hmm. And um, I was actually opening the gate of the nature center, you know, and it swooped down right in front of me. And I'm like, oh, wow. it was wow. so exciting. Mm -hmm. and, and we get visitors that call and say, oh, we saw one here, we saw one here, you know, so we're, people are seeing them and, and um, they want to report, you know, where and when. And it's becoming more frequent. Absolutely, yes. I mean, they're, you know, originally back in the 70s, the only place you could see a bald eagle in the state of Ohio was up at the lake around Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge, McGee Marsh, and now they're basically all over the state. We have nests and we have 88 counties in the state of Ohio, and uh, there's only maybe a dozen counties where we haven't had reports of a nest. So yeah, it's quite incredible. Oh, wow. Yeah. So keep your eyes up to the sky. Um, the, the juveniles look different than the adults, and we'll, we'll talk more about that. Mm -hmm. um, but they're definitely out there. Mm -hmm. So, um, you, how many eagles did you say there were in Ohio? So, estimated um, at least 300 breeding pairs. Um, we don't do, uh, so the Division of Wildlife used to keep very close track of all the eagle nests in Ohio, but since they've been delisted, um, and because there are so many nests, we just don't have the resources to monitor all the nests and keep track of them. So, every year we fly a uh, nest survey, but it's only, um, a very limited area in the state, so five square mile, or sorry, five ten square mile blocks, and they're located in different places throughout the state. So we use that, we document the increases in nests in those blocks, and um, and then we estimate the population based on those. So um, so we're at approximately 300 breeding pairs based on those surveys. I suspect that there may be more than that, but it, it's, again, we don't have an actual census of the nest. It's just a, a sample of, of all the nests in the area. Sure. So it's still, that that's a lot. How exciting. Yeah, that, so that translates to at least 600 adults. Plus there's all these juveniles and immature eagles floating out there. So, you know, maybe a thousand eagles in the state, something like that. Wow. Yeah. It's incredible. So exciting. Yeah. 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 And we'll, we'll talk with Bill Sheeman later on in the show, and he's going to talk more about the local mm -hmm. nests that we have right here, but that you've got the more of a statewide perspective. Mm -hmm. So um, nationally, how many are there so approximately? They estimate that there's about 10,000 um, breeding pairs. So that's, you know, at least 20,000. I mean, there's tens of thousands of eagles a lot. just in the continental United States, the lower 48. Wow. Alaska has a lot of eagles, uh, Canada. Um, so yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of eagles now compared to, you know, just 40 plus years ago. That's when they were listed on, on the endangered species mm -hmm. list. Yes. So yes. what a recovery. Yeah. Um, 
So are there still any threats today for the bald eagles? Yeah, there are still threats. So um, one of the big concerns is uh, poisoning from lead, um, particularly if um, uh, when uh, something is shot using lead pellets um, and then it's maybe not retrieved, uh, like a deer carcass or something like that, um, the eagles will come down. They're scavengers, so they'll, they'll forage on just about anything. And um, they can come down and they can accidentally ingest the lead pellets um, that that were in the, the animal and um, they that can caught that can poison them just like lead is toxic to us as humans it's also toxic to to eagles so um, so that is a is a big concern and so um, so one of the things that's been uh, put into place is the use of non-toxic non-toxic shot for uh, waterfowl or migratory bird game hunting mm -hmm. um, so that tries to help keep keep down the amount of lead going into the environment that these birds might encounter. Um, so, so that's a concern. Another concern is collisions with um, human-made objects. So um, eagles, um, unfortunately, run into power lines um, mm -hmm. fairly often. Uh, other structures like wind turbines are a concern. Um, and then, unfortunately, we have a lot of vehicle collisions. So if a, there's a carcass on the side of a road and an eagle is down feeding on it, um, sometimes they just don't realize that you know there's a car going by and they they end up getting hit. Um, especially the immature, the juveniles and immature eagles, um, mm -hmm. they just don't have enough sense yet to avoid the road. So, so those are some some major concerns. Um, and then obviously like habitat loss. I mean for for all wildlife, any loss of habitat is is going to have an impact and is still one of the major um, concerns for all wildlife species. Sure. So, so let's talk a little bit more about their habitat and their mm -hmm. um, nesting season. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, so eagles like to be around water. Fish are one of their preferred foods. Um, so they like to be around water. So that's one reason we have, have them around Caesars Creek. Um, uh, so wetlands, rivers, big rivers especially, so the Little Miami, the Scioto River, um, the Ohio River are, are places where you can find eagles um, up along the lake. Um, so those are all important to have water <laughs> nearby. But then for nesting, they need to have a fairly mature tree because their nests are quite large. So um, a lot of times you'll see trees in, in some of your larger sycamore trees along the rivers. Um, large trees on the edges of woodlots. Um, those are all kind of critical for, for nesting habitat. So what time of year do they start with their nesting? Yeah, well here in Ohio, um, usually January is a key time where they're, they're courting each other, they're starting to build their nests. We even see some birds starting to build nests or work on their nests in December, um, depending on the, the year and the weather. Um, but they usually won't start laying the eggs until sometime in February. And again, depending on where you are in the state, um, they might start earlier down here in the southern part of the state and a little bit later up in the northern part of the state. Um, and then uh, the eggs will start hatching. They incubate for about 35 days. And then the, the eggs hatch. And um, the young will be in the nest for 10 to 12 weeks. Um, so it, it takes a while for a, a chick to grow up into a, a fledgling eagle. And um, yeah, so then we'll start seeing fledgling eagles, you know, as early as sometime in May and then throughout the summer um, from May to July, yeah. depending on when the eggs were laid. So these are very hardy birds to lay their eggs in the coldest part yes. of the year. Yes. But that, yes. again, is why it's so critical. Everyone's interested in, in the eagle's nests. You know, mm -hmm. that's the first question I get. Oh, where's their nest? Mm -hmm. Like, no, I'm not going to tell you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. people don't realize how sensitive and how critical it is for the birds, especially during this very cold time. Because when they lay their eggs, if you scare them off too long, right. the eggs will freeze, you know. Mm -hmm. or, or if they're chicks, they'll die. Right. So right. It's, um, they're federally protected. Correct. That's correct. They're they're both state and federally protected, even though they're no longer listed on federal or state endangered species lists. They still have protections. Um, there's a federal law called the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, which is specifically for eagle protection. One of the reasons is because the bald eagles are national emblem. So. Um, so yeah, so there's specific protections for bald eagles, and that includes their nests. So 
Uh, so if you, um, so anybody who's harassing, um, taking, disturbing, uh, is liable under federal law. Um, so, uh, so um, take includes pursue, shoot, shoot at, poison, wound, kill, capture, trap, collect, molest, or disturb. So any, any behaviors like that um, can be punishable under the act. Um, so that's the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act. And then under our state laws, we have a, a, a law that's specifically for non-game birds. And um, under that law, the law states that bald and golden eagles and ospreys should not be killed or possessed at any time, um, except that eagles or os ospreys may be possessed with the proper permits for educational purposes by nature centers, museums, and, and entities like that. But you have to have both federal and state permits in order to, hmm. to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So you said one of the things was disturbing, and, and you can accidentally disturb them, you know, without even meaning to really, just right. by being too close. Right. So I see on Facebook, you know, or like the eagle cans and people posting pictures, and I, mm -hmm. it's great. I love to see them and watch their progress, and mm -hmm. and like we have uh, people like Bill Shima that monitor them. Right. It's very important. Right. Um, but also to be knowledgeable and to respect their space. Mm -hmm. And you know, if, you, if right. you're taking pictures, uh, like we've got some fantastic photos today mm -hmm. for the show and mm -hmm. um, they're all very respectable photographers that know to use you know, the big giant lenses right. and to not get too close. Right, exactly, yes. Yeah, yeah so actually um, some guidelines for uh, not harassing or disturbing the eagles is to stay at least 300 feet or 100 meters away from a nest if you're just hiking around. Um, so that's for recreational users and that, that's the recommended distance to stay away. Yeah. Um, so that's what I would advise people to stay at least that far away. Okay, yeah. very good. So uh, what does a baby bald eagle look like? Well, they're uh, fuzzy. Uh, they just have down feathers and they're grayish white. And um, and then as they grow, they'll molt in their uh, more permanent, not, well, not completely permanent, but their flight feathers, um, which will be a dark brown color. So by the time they are ready to fledge from the nest, they're basically brown, like a dark brown all over. They may have a little bit of white here and there, but not much. Okay. So they look very different from the adults. So the young eagles are dark. How, how long does it take them to get the white head and tails? Yeah, it actually takes them about five years to get that full adult plumage. Um, and so they actually go through several different uh, molt patterns over that time. And so you can uh, sometimes distinguish a second year eagle versus a third year eagle versus a fourth year eagle, but they have varying amounts of white um, and patterning um, based on their age. Wow. Yeah. So the ones at Caesar Creek, for example, um, there's <clears throat> a, several different ones actually. Okay. And I'm starting to be able to distinguish the difference by looking at them. You know, I use my binoculars, mm -hmm. but I can tell, you know, the ones that are five or six years old at least, mm -hmm. they have different markings. It's subtle, but I'm, I'm yes. starting to distinguish and I'm like, oh, that's this one. And you know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, they all have... Um, you know, just like humans, they ha they have their distinctive differences in plumage or eye color or, um, you know, shape of their beaks, you know. So, yeah, if you can get a good view for through the binoculars, yeah, you can see some of those differences in, and definitely get to know them. Mm -hmm. So if someone thinks that they have found an eagle nest, mm -hmm. what should they do? Well, um, don't go up to it and disturb it. Uh, definitely keep your distance. Um, if you can get a picture of it, and especially if you see the eagles in and around the nest, um, that would be great. We do, um, we recently created a reporting website on our, um, uh, on the DNR's website where people can report eagle nests on there. And so that's really helpful um, because we don't, we can't go out and look for eagle nests mm -hmm. <laughs> on a regular basis. So it's kind of nice if people locate one just so we have a record of it. So they can report that on the website and um, you can even submit the photo to that and that's, the best thing you can do, and um, and then we'll try to keep an eye on it. Okay, and so 
Last question, unless you have other things to add, is mm -hmm. uh, so what does DNR do to help protect the eel nests? Yeah, well, like I said, they are protected under our state laws as well as the federal laws, so we help enforce those laws however we can. Our wildlife officers help with that. Um, we continue the monitoring so we can keep track of the population and, and report those results. I mean, uh, we, we do have a, um, a place on our, our website where we update the population status um, on a yearly basis. And then we share those with the Fish and Wildlife Service as well so they can um, keep track of that, the populations. And, and they do um, reports every few years where they kind of uh, publish uh, what's happening with the population. Um, and then, you know, whenever we have to do some something on our wildlife areas, on our, um, like say, for example, we had a, a tree with an old eagle nest in it on a dike. And um, the nest wasn't an active any longer, but we went through the proper procedures of, we had to get a, a permit from the Fish and Wildlife Service, and we took all the care to make sure that it truly was an inactive nest. Um, so in removing that tree and that nest, um, you know, we went through all the proper procedures to do that in a manner that wasn't going to impact any any eagles that were using the nest actively. So, it's just an example. I mean, we need that dike to create the wetlands and manage the wetlands, which create the habitat for the eagles. So, you know, there's there's things like that that we're doing to help um, manage the habitat in a way that that's beneficial to the eagles. Sure. So, <clears throat> thank you for the work that you do and the research You're and. Uh, there's a lot of time and effort going on <laughs> in this in this project here, um, but we're not just out counting eagles. <clears throat> You're saving the environment, and it's not just eagles, like you said. It's it's a wide variety of fish and birds and and us. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, if we um, take care of the birds, we're taking care of ourselves too. So, yep. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Is there anything else you wanted to add? Um, no, I, I'm just, thanks for having me on the show and giving us this opportunity to talk about eagles. Yes, it's very interesting to, to, to hear a statewide perspective. So we're going to um, talk to Bill Sheeman and, and get a more local perspective. So okay. Thank great. you so much. You're welcome. We have Bill Sheeman with us on the show again today. Bill, it's been a pleasure knowing you for the last 10 years or so. I don't know how long. Um, actually, we recorded a show when the Eagles were first starting to come back. I remember. I do too, and I'm so excited and, and, and um, to see the population grow. So tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you got involved with this. Well, before I do that, I have to admit I was sitting off stage while you were recording the previous sec part of the program with Dr. Kearns and uh, we're so lucky to have her down here. I, I met her several years ago for the first time. I usually see her once a year at the Wildlife Diversity Conference that the Department of Natural Resources uh, run in Columbus every year. So. Uh, it's great to have her here on, on the show. Yeah, eagle expert, special guest. <coughs> a real guest expert. Indeed, uh, yes. But, you know, uh, I came to the Eagles uh, through the Ohio Certified Volunteer Naturalist Program, which, you know, gave me a chance to uh, get involved in a, in a lot of different areas. And uh, I've always loved uh, bald eagles. Uh, saw my first one when I was a young teenager and was bitten by the bug. And like you, I went decades without seeing one. And uh, the resurgence of them in this part of the state, and especially along the Little Miami River, is amazing. Yeah. So I think it was just a couple, was it last year? I don't know, when I was on the, the uh, Christmas bird count with you, yes. right? Everybody was quietly counting birds and an eagle swooped down and I screamed, ah! <laughs> I remember. Jumped up and down and scared all the birds away, but. It came right out of the sun. I thought it was a, I thought it was a red tail at first, but, but of course it wasn't. It and, uh, fills my heart with hope every time I see yeah. them because it, it's just a, I don't know, it's a, it's a sure sign of, 
conservation and education and, and the difference that it makes. It, it really is. I started monitoring uh, bald eagle nests along the Little Miami River and in the Little Miami watershed in uh, 2013. So six years already, uh, this year will be my seventh year. And when I started, there were two known nests. Uh, this year, I will be keeping my eye on seven nests. Wow. Just, it's, just, it's just incredible. Right here uh, in our local happening. area. And, and I, I think, you know, with Dr. Kearns, you've already talked about the recovery of the bald eagle in Ohio. And recoveries are slow. We went from those four uh, remaining pair up on Lake Erie to over 300 now. And it took decades to do that. And what we see is we reach a tipping point. And I think now we've really seen a tipping point in the Little Miami watershed. You know, we had two. It took us a number of years, six years, and uh, we're up to seven now. So the tipping point in this case was a positive one. We, you know, we, we really uh, changed things for the better. That's great. So can just anyone go out and monitor nests? Yes, yeah, so um, the answer is technically yes. Anyone can monitor a nest, but you really have to uh, stay away. You can't disturb them. You've covered that in uh, with Dr. Kearns. Uh, they're still protected by the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act and by other state law. Uh, the best thing to do for the general public, though, is to keep your distance. Uh, if you're close enough to a nest, if there's one in your area, uh, observe it from a safe distance. Take your family and friends there and just spread the word, okay? Keep your distance, but spread the word and enjoy the wonderful sight. Um, <clears throat> there are uh, people who uh, want to know how many eagles are fledged every year. The number of young eagles we fledge is really important. Uh, down here in this part of the Little Miami watershed, over the past six years, we fledged 27 eaglets. So 27 have been successfully raised and left the nest. Hmm. Uh, that's just amazing. And it's over a six year period. So we're now into uh, the part of the recovery cycle where some of our local birds that were fledged here may be returning to this geographic area. They don't always return, but some, some do. And some of the new mature birds, which are now looking for nest sites, could be eaglets that were fledged uh, in this part of Ohio. It's just, it's, it's just exciting. It captures the imagination. It, absolutely. And it, that's a, a, a good sign for me. Cause people ask me a, a lot where the eagle nests are. Yeah. And I protect that knowledge fiercely actually, because I'm afraid people are going to go out of curiosity up too close. <coughs> but, but knowing now that we have 27 in the area that... Well, 27 fledged. Fled. Seven fledged, nests. Yes. <laughs> so that shows me that people are respectful and are staying back and are um, respecting their distance. And, and there's all kinds of nest sites and nests. Okay, so along the uh, Little Miami State Park, the longest, thinnest state park in the state, which is basically along, we call it the bike path, uh, we've had nests for the past several years. It can be enjoyed and observed from a safe distance by anybody uh, moving up and down. The nests which are most at risk are those which are located near busy highways or pedestrian traffic. They don't always locate their nest in the best spot, but in this area, we have several that can be observed with no problem uh, by the public. I'm sure you're aware of the one uh, south of uh, Spring Valley Wildlife Area, which is right along, I mean, it can be viewed from the bike path, although it's probably 
you know, a half a mile from the bike path, but it's so large, high up in a sycamore tree. Mm -hmm. I mean, many people, I run and bike that section all the time. I just see countless people with binoculars, you know, standing there along the bike path, looking out across the uh, agricultural field and uh, watching the eagles come and go out of that tree. Hmm. So are there any nests that you know of that have um, been disturbed? Yeah, well, unfortunately, yes. For the first five years, all the nests, I, I generally, we had one new nest every year, but as the nests accumulated, none were disturbed. Every year, they were successful. Uh, last year, 2018, the spring of 2018, for the first time, we had two nests that were disturbed. And uh, one of those nests, you know, they had been incubating their eggs for about four weeks. I think you covered earlier, it's, it's a long incubation period, on average 35 days for a bald eagle. And uh, it was reported that some four-wheeler off-road vehicles were running around nearby that nest tree. And uh, one night they didn't get back on the eggs and, and they lost them. And a similar thing happened, a similar situation with another nest uh, happened and they were dirt bikes. You know, the assumption is they were people that didn't know the nest was there. Uh, both those situations have been reported to the Deep Department of Natural Resources and uh, they either have or are in the process of contacting landowners and trying to do more local education. But it just goes to show, you know, after a string of successful years, at any time, those nests can be in, at risk uh, if we have uninformed people. But sure. They weren't disturbed on purpose, but it doesn't make any difference. You know, they didn't fledge any young. Yeah. Hmm. So interesting. So it is very important. Absolutely. To monitor them and to, to protect them. Yep. And uh, we can definitely see the, the success story, you know, it, here locally and, and nationwide. Yeah. yeah, locally we're, I mean, the last couple of years we, we've got a new nest site every year. Hmm. I mean, so that's how we're up to, to seven now. And like I say, some of these can be observed with no risk to the, to the bald eagles at all. Yeah. And other ones, kind of like you say, other ones we keep them quiet because we don't want they're they're in risky locations, and uh, we'll, you know we we want them to be successful. Yes, absolutely. So, um, if if you want to see a bald eagle, you can go to any of our watershed areas. So we've got Little Miami River, Caesar Creek State Park, Cowan Lake State Park. I, I see them almost. Uh, I, not every day, but... Almost every day. Almost every day. Uh, I mean, you and I are tuned to them. So, I mean, we're looking up and we're able to differentiate uh, a vulture from a bald eagle from a red-tailed hawk. But there's so many now that uh, if, if you get out, if you get outside in the Caesars Creek area, Little Miami State Park area, Spring Valley Wildlife Area is a ter terrific chance and you've never seen a bald eagle, just get out there and spend some hours. I guarantee you will see one of these magnificent birds yeah. overhead. So at Caesar Creek, a lot of people ask me, so you can see them at the southern part of the lake near Wellman, you know, flying around, yep. and also towards the campground, I see them up there a lot too. Yep, and, and yep. They, they have a lot of good areas to hunt around here. I mean, Caesars Creek is a very sizable, uh, sizable lake. The Little Miami River is so healthy these days. I mean, the water quality has been improving in the Little Miami River for over 50 years now. Uh, and it's one of our state and national scenic rivers, so it gets a lot of attention. Uh, so it's been a magnet, the Little Miami River and Caesars Creek, uh, lake have been a magnet for these uh, birds. Besides the eagles, I mean another bird almost as large is the osprey. 
which uh, some people refer to as a fish hawk. We've had tremendous recovery of osprey. You and I have talked several times. There are an equal number of osprey nests. Uh, you have some right, right on state property mm -hmm. uh, down there, and. Uh, these birds are so big. It's <coughs> so neat to see them. The bald eagle, do you know how big the wingspan is? I don't know, six feet at least. Yeah, even larger. You know, you can uh, six to seven feet. The amazing thing is the bald eagles have a long history of stealing food from osprey. Okay. And osprey are very large, but they're no match for a bald eagle. Yes, when we go canoeing, I see them up in the sky fighting yeah. back and forth. One will catch and the fish will drop and then the eagle swoops yeah. around and it yeah. is incredible. Yeah, it's a, it's a typical thing you see. And, and again, it's another great reason to get outside in, in these state parks we have down there because we have a, a rich population now yes. of osprey and bald eagle. The bald eagle are here basically year-round unless we have a severe winter and then they will migrate far enough south to to have enough food to get through the winter but generally speaking the bald eagles are here year-round where the osprey you know they arrive uh, sometime uh, in April and uh, by the end of the summer they're headed south, okay, so they don't overwinter here, but, uh, but during the summer, both of those huge raptors are in our skies. And so I encourage exciting. you guys to learn how to identify yeah. it at a distance by the silhouettes and by their, by their sounds, yep. um, the osprey and a bald eagle and a vulture, yep. because a baby of juvenile bald eagle looks very similar to a vulture except for their flight pattern and their wing shapes and yep. their tails and their heads. The, the shape is different, but you have to be a tune, you know, but that's, I, I, that's why I see them is because I can tell the difference. Yeah. Yeah, the, the sound, especially the eagle sound, it's not exactly a beautiful uh, opera yes. or uh, huh. uh, uh, it, it's almost a, a, scry, a cry or a scream. Yes, it's like okay. a beep, 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 beep. It's yeah. not the thing you hear on TV, that majestic psh. Yes, that's, yeah. that's the red tail hawk. <laughs> yep. So television's put some uh, <laughs> <laughs> their own spin on, on the bald eagles, and it's yeah. confused some people, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think so. But, I mean, those are things you learn from being outside, and, uh, and uh, we can't blame everything on uh, television and movie producers. But... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so they're noisy. So the bald eagles are really noisy. They, uh, they're noisy around their nest. They're, they get excited when they're around other bald eagles that may or may not be their mates. And, uh, and this time of year, if there are any juveniles still left around the nest site, they're, they're getting their walking papers. You know, they're no longer, uh, they're no longer welcome because uh, the eagles in our area are becoming nest centric now they're they're back around their nest tree and uh they they don't want junior around now they're ready to raise their they're ready to raise their next uh yeah. next group so the the population of eagles and osprey and all these um birds in our areas is a testament i think to to the OCVM program and the, the education and the watershed, the cleanliness of our, of our area. So yeah. thank you, Bill, for what, you've, what you're doing and for Lara and you know, all of the citizen scientists that are out there that do care. It's making a difference. Thanks for inviting me here today. Yes, thank you. So that's it for today's show. If you'd like more information, you can check us out online at ohiostateparks.org and we'll see you on the trails.